Okay, so let's get ready and Ulf, you're on. Okay, excellent. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to NUPI and to this seminar uh, on uh, China and uh, oceans and the potential of a strengthened cooperation between Norway and China. So uh, my name is Ulf Svadrup and I'm the director of NUPI the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this seminar. Just a second here, uh, Osman, I have a problem with the, is that okay? Okay, yes. sorry. So this is a seminar that we've been asked to organize jointly together with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we do that, of course, with great pleasure. We have um, an exciting set of contributors, experts uh, participating and, and joining us in this conversation today. And we are particularly happy to welcome uh, some of our Chinese colleagues. So, and we have also colleagues all over the uh, Norway and digitally, probably all over the world. So, so welcome to all of you. Uh, we run on a bit of a tight schedule, so we ask the participants to to try to stick to the time limit, so we can cover a lot of topics in this conversation. Now, uh, let me just make a few remarks. Initially, oceans and ocean governance is rapidly becoming a very important global issue, and it's a key topic, a center stage in global affairs. It's related, of course, to the sustainable development agenda, but it is also related to many other ongoing activities. For Norway, oceans has been a key aspect in our foreign policy ever since the beginning of this country. It relates, of course, to Norway's history and position in shipping and maritime industries, but of course also related to Norway's activities within the field of fisheries and the management of natural resources. More recently, during the last few years, Norway has also taken on a position as trying to be a bit of a more play a bit more of a leading role in promoting sound and efficient sustainable ocean governance and also this is also involved, of course, the activities of our Norwegian Prime Minister. A core idea, I think, of Norwegian foreign policy is to establish a rules-based governance system with a strong role for scientific evidence in order to promote sustainable development. Now, China, on the other hand, is also, or even more so, a maritime superpower. In terms of shipping and maritime industry, China is the leading actor. In terms of number of ships in ports and in shipping industry, shipbuilding, etc. China is also, of course, the biggest consumer, I think, of seafood and of maritime resources. And China captures, I think, according to some accounts, eight times as much fish as Norway and around three times as much as the US. So it's the world's biggest fishing power. China is also, of course, really big in terms of aquaculture. By some account, it's even producing more than 60 times uh, the biomass uh, of Norwegian aquaculture. And China is also playing a big role in distant fishing fleet. There's a big distant fishing fleet that is often uh, fishing illegally and it's conducted within the permission of host states etc but china's presence as a global fishing power makes it uh, as uh, uh, a very significant actor in global oceans now moreover china is like many other countries investing in further strengthening its scientific understanding of the oceans to pave a foundation for a sound and sustainable governance. Now, on this blue planet that we all live on, we are faced with some serious challenges. 
So serious and important and bold steps are necessary in order to save the oceans. Saving the oceans and securing sustainable development requires international cooperation and a commitment to respect and compliance with international norms and rules, and that we also develop strong um, and credible scientific cooperation among countries and peoples. And of course, uh, China and Norway is therefore engaged in a conversation to see how the two parties can uh, better cooperate and also share agreements and disagreements and perspectives and views on how to further develop a sound and a sustainable ocean governance. Now, the background for this seminar is that the China Council has produced a report and we will hear more from the authors of this report. And hopefully this report is set to design and shape also China's ocean governance policy in the future. But before we do turn to that, we will have a, a, a short video from the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. So uh, could we run that video? Dear friends of the ocean, it's a pleasure to join you for this webinar hosted by the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Today's topic is both interesting and timely, building a sustainable ocean economy with a particular focus on strengthened cooperation between Norway and China on oceans. And I would like to extend a special thank you to Ambassador Yi and Professor Su for attending. We all know the importance of the oceans for life on our planet. Healthy, clean and productive oceans are essential if we are to achieve the sustainable development goals. In Norway's case, the oceans represent a common thread throughout our history. Sustainable use of the oceans has laid the foundation for Norway's prosperity and for the welfare of our population. Norway has been pursuing integrated ecosystem-based management of our ocean areas for decades, and we introduced an updated management plan last April. These management plans provide a basis for the long-term value creation in the ocean industries that are so crucial to Norway. Furthermore, they ensure that ecosystems are safeguarded. This approach is also at the core of the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, which was initiated and is led by Norway's Prime Minister, Anna Solberg. The panel is a unique initiative consisting of 14 world leaders wanting to build momentum towards a sustainable global ocean economy. The panel plans to present its conclusions and priority actions on 3rd of December. Along these same lines, Norway together with partners has launched an international initiative to establish a global agreement on marine litter and microplastics. Pollution of the oceans is one of the fastest growing environmental concerns of our time. Our aim is to encourage a common direction for international efforts to address this urgent challenge. Dear friends, these are some of the elements we intend to bring into our ocean dialogue with China. At the same time, I want to underline that oceans are already a key element of bilateral cooperation between Norway and China. Current areas of collaboration are diverse, involving businesses, research communities, and governmental agencies. I'm therefore pleased to see that today's impressive list of participants, including leading experts and stakeholders from all these sectors. We are eager to hear your views on the prospects for strengthening cooperation on oceans with China, both the possibilities and the challenges. Your input is important for our further efforts to establish an ocean dialogue with China. Thank you very much, and I wish you every success with this webinar. Okay. Okay, am I, am I back now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you so much to the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ina Eriksen Sørede. It's a perfect uh, backdrop for this uh, seminar. Uh, as I said, uh, we have a pleasure to welcome in particular some of our friends and colleagues uh, from China. And now I'll, I'll give the uh, floor or the screen to, to Professor uh, Jilan Su. He is the Honorary President of the Second Institute of Oceanology from the Ministry and the Ministry of Natural Resources in Beijing. And is also a, 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 a 
uh, a professor at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So, uh, Professor Yilan Su, can you hear? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. And yes, working. So excellent. The floor is yours. Great to have you with All us. Right. And, 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 and please. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sverdrup, for inviting me to join this uh, very important uh, dialogue between the Norway and Ch Chinese uh, scientists. And today I'm going to report on a uh, report from the Special Policy Study on the Global Ocean Governance and Ecological Civilization. This is the end of the, uh, you know, the, the uh, you just said the, the council, the council. The name of the council actually is right on top of the screen here. It says China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development. So from now on, I just refer to the acronym CCICD. Okay. So the next slide here says that the CCICD is actually a very high level international advisory body, which is approved by the, Chin the Chinese government, was founded in 1992, right after the, uh, re the, uh, the you know, the, 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 the onset. The CCICD, it gives advice to the Chinese government. It, it's focused mainly on the uh, ecological civilization and sustainable development. You understand that because that, you know, the fun, fun, funding of that come right after the onset, the United Nations action, right? Now, the, uh, the CCICD is, the, the work of the CCICD is been by a group, a large group of prominent Chinese and international experts. Including the the panel members of CCICD and also invited experts for specific you know, tasks. But CCICD is also provides a very good platform for the exchange of um, exchanges between the Chinese and the international community on environment and on, and on development policies. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yangana? Yes, okay. The, uh, see, if you look at the chart at, at, the, at the bottom of the screen, you can see that under the CCIC, the, there are several task forces, okay? On the very left, there's a task force specifically on the ecological civilization. As many of you may know that China takes on a very uh, serious approach to develop, develop ecological civilization within China. So therefore, against this background, then this task force then set up the Ocean SPS, the Ocean Spe you know, Special Policy Study, which focuses on the uh, uh, the, the oceans, the, the the ocean, the ocean governance. Okay. Next slide. Now, for this you know special policy study on the global ocean governance and ecological civilization. We, we will map out the relevant ocean and the coastal issues of priority concern to, the, to China. And then we also will provide you know, guidance to the Chinese on areas and topics which the China may be able to take a leading role. We will also you know, map out ongoing national and international ocean initiatives and undertakings relevant to those issues. And then they, the, uh, we will advise the CCICD uh, how to, you know, to, to complement and continue on this efforts. And so they advise, of course, to the Chinese government. We also, okay, the, uh, okay. And now I'm trying to say, say now that how does the, 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 the in our special group set up the uh, task teams. So let's first take a look at the economy in China. Next slide. As you can see that over the last 40 years, there's a phenom phenomenal rise of the Chinese economy, right? And uh, next click, please, yes. And along with the, uh, the, 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 uh, the economy in China, the ocean economy also you know, rises the, at the same pace because the, the, if you look at the, the, the bottom line over there, it says that over the last 15 years, the, the the ocean economy in China co contributes around 3.6 to 4 percent of the the gross GDP of China itself. So therefore, both the Chinese economy and the, the ocean economy exert a very st strong pressure on the 
marine environment. Next slide. So as a consequence of the pressure, both from the land and also from the ocean, the, Chinese, the China's coastal seas, you see a lot, you know, very serious de degradation. I mean, using now Bohai Sea as an example. Bohai Sea is about uh, one fifth the, the size of the uh, Baltic Sea, but the depth is only 18 meters, okay, much shallower than the Baltic Sea. Next slide. Now, if you look at the, the in spite of the fact that the, the, the Bohai Sea is very shallow, nevertheless, during the summer, it has very well stratified water. So therefore, the bottom water then will grad, develop a gradually depletion of the oxygen. But in the past, if you look at, you know, 40 years ago, the bottom is still okay, you know, the, for, the, for the marine organisms. But in recent years, you can see a very rapid drop of the dissolved oxygen way down to almost to the hypoxia now. Next slide. Now, if you look at the uh, trophic level, which shows, you know, in a way, reflects the biodiversity in, in a way, you can see that in the 40 years ago, uh, the, you know, the, the is very healthy, but, it, 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 you know, it, as time goes on to now, uh, we, we see very little, you know, uh, fish there, the trophic level drops down very, very drastically. Next slide, please. Now let's look how we, you know, determine the task teams. We, when you look at the the, uh, the degradation, of course, marine pollution would be, you know, one important task team to to do. And then uh, Dr. Sverre just mentioned that in Norway, you've, you, you know, you you you've running the uh, ecosystem-based integrated ocean management for many years, and China wishes to do that as well. So therefore, we set up one sector, one uh, task team on that. Uh, aspect, and for the other four task team, we we choose the ocean the sectors of ocean economy. Next slide, please. Now this shows you the the the, the ocean economy in China. That you, if you look at the sectors, right? This this sec this picture actually looks similar to the ones, for example, in the uh, European Union or the United States. Okay, the tourism is the largest part. Then the next, as far as China's concerned, is the maritime operation and the marine fisheries. For this study, you know, we did not pick the, uh, the tourism, but instead we picked the marine fisheries and the mar maritime operations. In addition, we also picked the two emerging uh, industry, which is like seabed mining and also renewable energy. Next slide, please. The reason we picked the fisheries is because, you know, uh, before, be, before the uh, uh, the uh, b before my presentation, Dr. Sprilger mentioned very clearly that you know China indeed has a very large um, part in the contribution in the marine culture. Actually, it's, it overpays the, uh, the the capture fisheries here. This is the one reason why we picked the fisheries for our task team. I think I'm going to turn over my slides now to Yang Gunner now, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you, Professor Su. Um, and thank you for arranging this, uh, Nupi. Um, it's a big honor to, to be present in this webinar. Uh, I'm now going to focus more on the recommendations that came out of our work. But um, first, uh, the framing of the study, and, and Professor Su has already touched upon this. Uh, we decided uh, to identify then six different topics, as you can see here. Uh, and each one of them, uh, we had an expert group, uh, both of Chinese experts and international experts, uh, and they provided uh, and published a report, uh, each one of them. So there are six uh, detailed reports on each of these topics with their own recommendations. And today I will then um, address recommendations that we have done uh, in a final report, building on these six um, detailed reports, uh, and that is by no means all of the recommendations. So in, in a way, we will only see today at the top of the iceberg of recommendations, so to speak. Well, if you look at United, the left of this... Young United, can I ask you to put on your camera, please? Because I don't think you're... You, you, so it's easier to follow you if you put on your camera as well. Yeah, so, you see, I you. lost... Um, I, I don't know, the organizer um, blinded me in the way that I only see the screen without this uh, 
legend of camera and um, and mic. So uh, okay, we'll see can we'll see what we can do. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no, okay, let's fine. continue. It's working anyhow. Yeah. Okay, so um, each one of these six uh, topics should also address what we identified as four important cross-cutting teams, climate change, economy, technology, and gender. Now, the way we started this was, um, in a way, three principles, uh, and you see that to the left of this figure. Um, uh, ecosystem is at core. A healthy ecosystem will then be a productive and resilient one. That is the core of, of our starting point. Uh, second, uh, we have the principle of striking the balance between protection and production which means including all activities and industries connected to the ocean, which is the outer circle here, surrounding the ecosystem and the globe, if you wish. And thirdly, uh, looking at these industries in a holistic and integrated way, in contrast to what, which unfortunately is done many places around the world, sector-oriented approaches, uh, we wanted to have this holistic integrated way of attack, attacking uh, this work. So first, to some of the general points of our recommendations, uh, we uh, encourage uh, the Chinese government to continue the efforts that were already in the 13th five-year plan into the 14th five-year plan, uh, and clearly bringing into the framework of beautiful China the importance of marine ecological civiliz uh, civilizations as a fundamental goal. Uh, this recommendation is meant to raise awareness that China's ambitions for sustainable development, which is called ecological civilization, must include both land and ocean. So that's the overarching one. Then we went into the environmental uh, aspects uh, where we uh, say clear and directed actions are needed to limit the threats and minimize uh, the impacts to the ocean and thereby lay the foundation for the ocean's ability to continue to serve both as the basis of human life and as a provider for economic development. Um, China's coastal seas, as we heard Professor Su explain, declines in quality. So that's the domestic perspective. Uh, on the global perspective, we see that uh, ocean conditions in general are being seriously affected by global warming, increased ocean acidification, microplastics pollution, and over-exploitation of natural resources. Uh, and we address in the report that um, the ocean environment will, over the next decades, undergo substantial change, uh, both in a domestic perspective and in a global perspective, in particular due to climate change, uh, and as will the types and extent of ocean industries, they will also develop um, and the scale and scope of these changes challenge current management regimes. Therefore, it's essential and urgent to develop integrated ecosystem-based management frameworks that capture this dynamic development in nature and in ocean economies. So, then to industry, uh, in no doubt, the ocean carries great potential for China's economic and social development with dedicated efforts to ensure uh, that the future development of current and also emerging industries uh, is done in a sustainable manner, the potential held in ocean can be carried through into the future. Uh, and then last, in a way, both integrated, integrating and balancing the environment and the industries is the importance of what we then call integrated ocean management. China needs to continue to develop, to develop its effort to manage its ocean's interest, both nationally and globally, so as to strike the balance between protection and production and on the basis of the principle of integrated ocean management, which is then shown in this small figure. Now, there is an overwhelming uh, number of uh, recommendations, and, and uh, I know it's a lot of text in this, uh, in this view graph, but I will now, in the next few slides, um, collect uh, within different topics. So this one is about biodiversity, and I will especially bring to your attention what is here in yellow uh, text. Um, and um, one of the actions that we recommend is then to reduce land-based pollution. There is quite a lot of land-based pollutions coming from many places, including the rivers, uh, and it reaches the sea. 
uh, in addition uh, to this and, and, and also how to tackle that, we promote innovations in cleaner production methods and means of reducing discharges and emissions. Um, the second bullet point uh, refers to habitat destruction. Uh, we know there is an urbanization uh, and uh, land reclamation uh, along the coastal areas and also coastal wetlands. Uh, we address this and, and recommend to avoid further destruction and also in the next 10 years to re-establish degraded or destroyed coastal wetlands that once served as a key habitats uh, and get back to the normal situation. Uh, number three is about uh, environmentally friendly mariculture uh, and also combating illegal fishing and we um, recommend by 2025 to have a full output control implemented for all fishery activities. This is quite ambitious, but we also think it's very important. Uh, the last one uh, concerns implementing an ecological environmental damage compensation system and also improve the public participation system for marine environmental protection. Um, and um, we, we also address that the Ministry of Ecology and Environment should carry out a natural capital accounting for the ocean. So every undertaking is being evaluated in an official ecosystem based performance uh, approach. So to climate change and first uh, climate change action policies, uh, we of course, uh, acknowledge the Paris Agreement uh, and the importance of fulfilling the goals in that agreement. And we point then in the first bullet point to, again, what was actually in the last biograph, the importance of restoration of coastal wetlands, but now in a climate change perspective, because by improving the coastal wetlands, we will also uh, establish uh, blue forest and sequester carbon. The second one is about both understanding and assessing the impacts of climate change on living marine resources and evaluate ways of mitigating the impacts. So that's the action policies on climate change. The next one is about adaptation. There is no doubt that climate change will happen regardless of um, ambitious um, actions, unfortunately. Uh, and we address this uh, and especially put emphasis on the importance of developing ecosystem based integrated management frameworks that capture the dynamics which is now involved in uh, rapid um, changes uh, that is introduced by climate change, but also in the ocean economies themselves. Then turning to um, one thing that was in our mandate that Professor Su uh, addressed, where can China take leadership on ocean issues? Uh, and we identify two very overall general uh, areas. Uh, one is connected to the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, where we address that uh, a greening of the one belt, one road uh, could um, include guidelines for zero environmental impact. Um, it's about developing green fishing vessels and green fishing ports, green mariculture and promoting green shipping also in the Arctic. Um, and as well promoting the concept of integrated ocean management as a principle in all ocean uh, management. We also acknowledge that there are many processes and fora internationally that is very important now for the ocean agenda. Uh, and we uh, recommend that China takes actively part in this and also spearhead relevant discussions in fora like Paris Agreement, uh, Biodiversity Convention, uh, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, International Maritime Organization, International Seabed Authorities and more. Uh, importance of knowledge uh, is um, addressed very carefully in the report. Uh, and the first one is about both expanding and implementing national and regional systematic programs for data and knowledge gathering and technology development. The second bullet points also uh, point towards the importance of the IOC ocean decade and uh, that China takes an active role in 
designing and also implementing the ocean decade when it comes to science and technology. Uh, on the lower part of this page, uh, we have some thoughts that um, we and we recommend actually that it is established formal mechanisms at the national level in China um, and could be in the form of a scientific advisory body to the government to underpin both coordinated and holistic use of knowledge in instituting overarching policies on environment and development connected to ocean economy. So this is a suggestion we make. And then my, my last uh, slide here is about the importance of coordination. China, as we know from many other countries, including Norway, uh, coordination is a challenge, but it's also a key to improving and also having more um, effective use of resources. But we identify um, the need for coordination mechanisms, uh, both uh, across um, structures, um, uh, it could be administrative uh, ones connected to the land and ocean. We see the regulations in, in China has uh, often and rules and regulations are connected to either land or ocean. They are not aligned uh, perfectly well. Uh, this is not the typical Chinese issue, but, but this is uh, also the reality there. And then uh, cross-sectoral coordination uh, and communication on both national, regional and local levels. And this coordination, coordination mechanism we suggest uh, is then a body across relevant government ministries to support development of policies fostering and underpinning ecosystem-based integrated ocean management. We, we come back to the need and importance of integrated ocean management in, I guess, more or less all our recommendations because we believe it is really a key to a, a sustainable uh, way of managing oceans. And I should then say by ending, um, there are more recommendations and this were a selection from the final report. Uh, and as I said, in the six topical reports, there are individual um, series of recommendations. So I'm sorry I couldn't in 10 minutes take you through all, but this is at least some of the most important recommendations we have made to the State Council of China. Thank you for now. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Young Gunnar. Uh, okay, to all of you who now we have seen a seamless presentation where Professor Yilan Su has been sitting in China, whereas uh, Young Gunnar Winter, uh, who's a specialist director at the Norwegian Polar Institute, has been actually clicking on the slides from Tromsø in Norway. Uh, and, uh, and thank you so much. That worked very well. Uh, uh, and 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 uh, it was really interesting. Now uh, I think we are left with three sets of questions and topics for discussion, as I see it, that is relevant. Uh, and one is to discuss the recommendations itself from the China Council or CCIED. The second point it would be to discuss to to ex uh, the extent to which these recommendations. Uh, could be implemented and what are how to make these recommendations efficient and what are potential hindrances for the implementation of them. And the third aspect is, of course, how to ensure that the bilateral dialogue between China and Norway could build upon some of these aspects and have, have to further implement and uh, to follow up some of these recommendations. So, so I think that's at least three different sets of questions that are related coming out from these two uh, presentations or one joint presentation. But first, before we turn to the discussion, uh, we would like to invite two other speakers uh, to add and uh, uh, to make some comments and remarks. But before I give the floor to, to the first speaker, let me just remind all of you that you can now participate in the conversation by submitting questions or, or comments in, in the, and use the chat function. And then that allows me to, to eventually see the inputs that you have provided. And then I can try to convey some of your questions and remarks back to the or distinguished panelists. So, Please go ahead and do that uh, while we listen to the other speakers. But first, 
Now I'd like to give the floor to Harald Solberg, who's the director of the Norwegian uh, Ship uh, Ship Owners Association. Harald, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ulf, and I'm very glad to have the opportunity to participate in this discussion on how to strengthen cooperation between uh, China and Norway on ocean issues and within the maritime industry. And thank you to Professor Yilan Su and Jan Gunnar Winter for a presentation of a very interesting uh, report. Uh, Norway has for many years relied on integrated ocean management, and this approach has been vital for the businesses and made us able to harness the ocean and develop a wide range of ocean industries at the same time as we focus on keeping our oceans healthy and rich. And I think we all share the concerns described in the report on the health of, the, of our oceans, and we fully support the recommendations uh, of the report related to integrated ocean management and how it should be the basis for further developing a sustainable ocean economy. China is the most important market in Asia to Norwegian shipping companies. And during the state visit to China two years ago, the Norwegian and the Chinese Ship Owners Association signed an MOU uh, on green shipping. Norway and China are among the world leading maritime nations and both countries have clear ambitions when it comes to the de 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 decarbonization of shipping. About 30% of all Norwegian controlled ships are built in China which make China uh, one of the most important con uh, construction countries for Norwegian shipping companies. At the same time, Norway is at the forefront of the development of ne new green technology for shipping. Norwegian environmental technology and Chinese uh, shipyard expertise will be important when building new green ships in line with future emission requirements. With the energy transition our world is facing, there will be new possibilities for increased cooperation related to maritime technology and renewable energy sources. And we see great potential for strengthening the cooperation between the Chinese and Norwegian maritime industry. And global ambitions to cut emissions and decarbonize shipping should be used as key to unlock the full uh, potential. And let me therefore say a bit more about the Norwegian shipping industry's climate ambitions. Today, uh, shipping is carrying 80% of global world trade. It is the most energy efficient way of transporting goods. However, in order to reach the goals set out in the Paris Agreement, shipping needs to do more to reduce our emissions. And earlier this year, we launched our new climate strategy uh, with, with the ANSA, where the overarching goal is for the entire Norwegian foreign going fleet to be climate neutral by 2050. And from 2030, our members of Norwegian Ship Owners Association aim to only order vessels with zero emission technology. These goals make this decade until 2030 to a decade of transition. We have to develop and deploy new solutions to make zero emission technology available and profitable. We believe ambitious goals will help accelerate the necessary development. This means the entire industry in collaboration with authorities, both nationally and internationally, must engage in developing new and profitable green technology. And we appreciate the recommendation in the report on targeted investments and framework for green technologies. The backdrop to uh, all political dialogue across borders today is uh, the global pandemic that we are in the middle of handling. And going forward, let us use this opportunity to make the recovery a green one. I think we all agree and support the huge potential in the oceans with re within renewable energy, increased food production, harvesting of minerals and medicines from the sea, and the continued transportation of goods. To succeed, I believe, like the researchers behind the China Council report, that we need an integrated management of the ocean. And not least, we need more international cooperation, not less, as, is, as it sadly is the trend in the international politics today. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward for, to the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Harald, Harald Solberg. Uh, thank you so much. And then we give the floor to our final uh, speaker in the program uh, in this session, 
and that's uh, Hanne Grete Nilsen. She's the uh, uh, she's a special advisor in the Norwegian Environment Agency. Uh, it's great to have you with us, uh, uh, Hanna. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, dear Mr. Ambassador, dear audience, and uh, Professor Sue and uh, Mr. Winter. Congratulations with a very good report. I'm grateful that I have been invited here to comment on uh, the report and on the possible cooperation between uh, China and Norway. And also, firstly, to, to uh, introduce you briefly to the core elements of the Norwegian management plans. So I have uh, brought a presentation, if that's OK. I will share my uh, screen with you. Uh, Actually, it looks like it works. I'm not sure. Now it disappeared from me. This, does it work? Yes, it, yes, it works. I'm a, yeah. I'm a get Excellent. Very, very good. Well, um, there are Norwegian management plans for our three, our three large marine ecosystems. One for the Barents Sea up in the north, one for the Norwegian Sea, and one for the North Sea in the south. And uh, these have prepared as, uh, been prepared as white papers to the parliament. The process started in 2002 with the strategy laying the foundation for the various management plans. And they have been updated at uh, intervals uh, with the final uh, report being presented uh, last spring. And this report covered all three uh, management areas. The plans present the national policies for our ocean areas and the purpose is to provide a framework both for value creation through sustainable use and at the same time to maintain the ecosystems and their services. So the plans, they increase the predictability for marine industries. From now on, uh, a white paper on the management plan for the Norwegian sea areas will be presented to the parliament every four years. Um, through our management plans, we implement an integrated ocean management. Um, every four years is an iteration of the management cycle with continuous improvements. So if you st start with preparing a knowledge base on environment, human activities, value creation, and other information which is needed for decision makers. Then this knowledge base is used to prepare the white paper, the management plan, and then implementation phase starts with the implementing actions and measures agreed in the management plans. We gather, gather new knowledge and we receive new scientific advice based on research and monitoring, and again updates the knowledge base. And when it's updated, we again update the management plans. So this is a cycle every four years. Um, and during this process, in all these steps in the process, stakeholders are invited to comment and give input and their views. So this is adaptive management, as you see it. Measures and actions are improved and adjusted according to new knowledge and the system how it works is adjusted in light of experience. So uh, about the organizational setup of the process in Norway, it's a cross-sectoral uh, setup. And uh, we see this as very important to gather all sectors and sit together around the same table in a context. We learn from each other and we learn about each other. We learn about and understand our each other's responsibilities and our challenges. We divide the process in two phases, two distinct phases, uh, uh, the, the descriptive phase and the decision phase. Um, at the bottom here, we have two groups, a management forum and a monitoring group. The, and these two groups together form the, uh, the common knowledge base for the management plan. The management forum uh, comprises 12 different agencies and uh, is chaired by the, 
the Environment Agency, and the monitoring group comprises research institutes and agencies and is chaired by the Institute of Marine Research. These groups get their mandate, their terms of reference from the steering committee, the interministerial steering committee, which is in the box here. And they work by consensus. So normally the different groups meet uh, four times a year and uh, either physically and or virtually, more virtually in these days. And uh, the, when the knowledge base is uh, finished and prepared, it is sent for uh, or presented to stakeholders for a hearing, for in giving inputs and comments, and then finalized and handed over to the steering committee, the ministerial group. The, then starts the decision phase. The, they negotiate national policies and agree on measures. And when they have finished the management plan, the white paper, it's sent it over to the government and then to the parliament. I'd like to comment on some possible areas of cooperation based on the report that was presented. And I have focused naturally on the, the recommendations from the task group one on integrated ocean management. So, uh, to develop an ecosystem-based integrated ocean management regime, regime by exchanging knowledge and experience on. I've chosen three topics here. Uh, use of scientific knowledge and monitoring results. We're monitoring based on indicators for ocean status, pressures and impacts could be useful. Um, and next uh, point here, which I've chosen, is the up-to-date knowledge base and data sharing, which uh, can comprise both the collection of, uh, of data and information, the storing of it, sharing and dissemination of the data needed for management decisions. We have very good experience uh, with our system, with the management plans in Norway, with translating knowledge and science into management. Uh, the last point I have here is cross-sectoral cooperation between relevant authorities, which is mentioned in the report. Um, we have also gained good experiences of sitting together around the same table and creating a common knowledge base. So I think uh, in conclusion, the, the report is a good platform for further developing a closer cooperation between China and Norway on integrated ocean management. And the Norwegian Environment Agency looks forward to cooperating with Chinese authorities on this topic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Hanne uh, Greta, for, for those remarks and also for sharing uh, a bit uh, more in detail about how the management system in Norway works. I think that was very timely. Now, before we open up for a general discussion, let me ask uh, one question to Yilan Su, and maybe it's related to Hanna Greta uh, com uh, comments as well. I think that you've done an important job in creating a management system or recommending some kind of core principles for governing resources. And also, of course, on addressing the issue of oceans as a problem that has to be solved. But listening to what Hanna Grete said about the system in Norway, I think it's not only science and knowledge that is kind of the core, but there's also an element of trust. There's some kind of idea that some of these rules and principles are implemented and complied with, and that there are also an element of policing to it. So I'm just curious, uh, Yilan Su, about since you have been very much involved in formulating these principles and recommendations, what do you see as the main difficulties, hurdles on the way of the implementation of these principles? Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. I think there, there are two aspects. Okay, one of course is uh, from the the the, uh, the the government side. 
you know, as uh, Yang Gana mentioned that, you know, in China, you have the province, you have, you know, cities, and you have, uh, you know, ma many, many uh, governing bodies, okay. However, the ocean itself, they are not governed by the, you know, by the jurisdiction boundaries. They're governed by the ecosystems, okay. So therefore, for China then, you know, one recommendation from us is that they should, you know, try to set up set up a coordinating mechanism such that, you know, such kind of boundary can, in a way, disappear. Okay, this is the first part. Mm. The second part, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't follow your, your name. Okay, <laughs> the, the lady. Okay, <laughs> the, uh, you know, to, to have measurements and so forth, you know, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, however, you ha you know you, you, so you, in the in the in, no in Norway, I think your stakeholders. We talk about fishermen, okay. Probably have a very few of them, okay. In China, the fishermen, the fishermen. I forget the number now, but I just throw an arbitrary number: sixty million, you know, <laughs> fishermen. Okay, so there's, there's a huge number there. So mm -hmm. how do you you know get them to work? And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing, okay. Uh, likewise, you know, Dr. Spurgeo mentioned about the list, you know, fleet and so forth. Yes, you know, China does have a large fleet there. Most of them follow the rules, but a few of them they did not. Okay, so how do you policy? You know, policy this is, is something which is difficult to to achieve. But but they are trying to do that. Of course, you know, we we also have our the recommendation in our in our uh, study, okay, to try to, to, to do that. So the two components I'm talking about, one is from the top, which is the managed point of view from the government, okay. The second is from the, the, the bottom, okay, the, the, the stakeholders. Mm. Uh, just uh, as I understand it, Gina, I, I, I think this is really important, your for, first remark, is that a lot of the pollution and destruction of oceans happens on the land, right? And in order right. to make sure that oceans are safe, you have to establish a better link between what is happening on the land and what is relationship to the oceans. And I think this comes out very clearly in your report. And this is also the extremely important way that the global uh, global uh, climate changes and CO2 emissions, etc., is also leading to destructions of the ocean so but it's the land-based activity that destroys the oceans to a large extent i think that's an extremely important point uh, you also as i understand the the topic of fishing illicit fishing state aid to fishing capacity the link between land-based industry and fishing activity etc and this empowerment of consumers in order to to uh, to buy uh, fish that is fished in a sustainable fashion, etc. Those issues are not covered in your report, as I understand it. But there's a special task force dedicated to that. Could you say a few words about that, uh, Professor Ilansu? I don't think I can I can say that explicitly. But I don't know whether Yang <laughs> Yang can you can you mention can you cover that? Well, um, I should maybe clarify that um, in, in, in the special policies that is in the China Council, there is a, a, a um, um, the depth of the analysis is still on the macro level. So we are not diving into details. We are suggesting um, recommendations that are uh, at the abstracted um, level. Uh, when it comes to empowerment of, uh, of consumers, uh, this has not been a direct um, address in our reports, maybe exception of the pollution task team, because the, the awareness raising among the uh, citizens uh, and empowerment of, of, the, uh, of the consumers related to uh, the pollution uh, issue and, and reducing uh, the amount of pollution was, was addressed in that report. So um, there are, as I said, six standalone reports with their own recommendations. They are all, uh, very soon at least, all available at the homepage of the China Council. And for those who take a special interest in, in these topics, they should, should go there. Uh, what we have seen today is, in a way, the, the overall um, main recommendations from, from the final part of this work in, in its final report. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you. We have uh, lots of questions already in our feed. So if uh, please continue to send in and use this uh, Q&A function in, in the Teams uh, software and you can submit questions. So uh, let me just try to pick a few questions that they have uh, come and tr I'll try to group some of them. And uh, several have asked questions related to to the extent to which this report has been kind of influencing Chinese policy making. So you referred to, to the five-year plan, Jan Gunnar and, uh, and uh, Yilan Su. Uh, to what extent, so which recommendations do you think have the biggest chance to be translated into the five-year plan? And, uh, uh, and uh, and are, do you have any thoughts on how the Building a Sustainable Ocean Economy for China report are considered in the proposed plans that were discussed uh, last uh, Thursday by the Central Committee? So it's about the implementation and the picking up of these ideas. If, uh, if I start, because the last, I think, uh, Professor Su is absolutely best uh, in a position to answer, but but over time since '92, um, the the recommendations that have been provided through the council has had significant impact on policies in China. I think the record shows that very clearly. So that's one point. The second point I would like to make is that ocean, the topic of ocean, is uh, almost new. It was one task force back ten years ago where Professor Su also was involved. But basically. It has been land and atmosphere, soil and, and climate change and so on, but the ocean issues has not been addressed. And now for the first time, uh, oceans are really at the agenda in the Council and also not only in a domestic uh, dimension, but in the global dimension and one bet one road is also um, part of this. So, so we believe and we know that in the report from the Council itself that reports to the State Council, which is the upper seven um, persons in, in the government of China, uh, the importance of uh, key elements that we have touched upon today on the ocean issues are reported and recommended, recommended to the State Council. What happened last Thursday, I don't know, but hopefully Professor Su can uh, can uh, get some clarity on that one. Okay, Professor Stu. I don't have any inside line. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese way of mapping out the five-year plan, you know, they get inputs from many different sources. Okay, The CCICED can put the, you know, its voice into the uh, state council, okay? So it's more direct. So therefore it's more, you know, uh, influential. But if you want to say well, which one they picked, it's difficult to, to pin that down, okay? But for me, you know, I would say that this year, we, because we, we proposed that we, we want to address the ocean issue. The different, and, uh, different uh, local administrations, you know, they have to coordinate. Uh, different ministries, you know, like the Ministry of Natural Resources, and the Ministry of the, uh, the, the the Environment, they have to coordinate, okay, to, in order to address the ocean problem. I think those message, I believe, will be taken up by the five-year plan. So only in that way you can address the ocean problem because because the ocean is so dynamic. If you don't do that, you cannot address the, the ocean problem, basically. Mm. So I think you know that that particular point probably. My my guess is that will be taken up by the by them in a way. You... Mm. Okay, uh, let me throw another set of questions. So, Yilan uh, Su, what you have heard from some of the Norwegian participants here? So we heard it from Harald Solberg that was supportive, and you heard it from Hanne Grete Nilsen, also supportive of some of the steps and the recommendations made in the report. But I'm just curious. What do you take, Ilan Su, what do you see as, or from Chinese side, as particularly interesting in Norwegian management that you could, principles and, and uh, regulations, that is some, some kind of things that you, you find some inspiration from. Uh, so that's the first part. And the, the second part relates to 
how do you see uh, China Norway cooperation evolving in the future? How, what should be done, and and uh, and uh, what kind of relationship do you also see in relation to the Arctic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the uh, excuse me. The uh, uh, we talk, let's first talk about maritime operations. Okay. Mm -hmm. In China, the, actually there are two components. Okay. One is the big ports, okay, like Shanghai, like you know the uh, Tianjin and so forth. The big ports. I think the big ports they have modern facilities. I think in a way the management is also not all, not every one of them, but but many of them are up to date. You know, uh, Yangana and, and and me. You know, we we visit one I guess in in, in the south or somewhere there. So those I think are close in some way to the standards of, of the Norway. Okay. And uh, of course, they they also learn a lot from the uh, the the uh, uh, developed country like Norway and so forth. However, you know you have to realize that we talk about you know such a large fishing fleet, right? They have to go into some port as well. So actually, in our study, we identify the huge fleet of the fishing fleet and also the ports, and there you need to do a lot of things to you know to to modernize them to get them the uh, uh, you know, to to have the uh, the the carbons and pollutions and then so forth. Those you know that we can do a lot. And the uh, the Norwegian people, you know, you ha you have lots of uh, experience in 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 small ports as well. As I'm, I'm sure you know. So that that part, I think we we can you know cooperate, right? And of course, in the, in, in many other areas, because uh, as you said, the Norway is a maritime country for a long long history. Whereas China, you know, look more towards the land, not to the ocean. So therefore, you have more experience to share with us. So therefore, you know, but at the moment, of course, China is trying to expand its own in maritime marine activities. So therefore, we have a lot to learn from you. And so there's a good chance to cooperate. And by, you know, uh, by cooperating, of course, the China then will contribute better to the environment of, of, of the global ocean, of course. In that in that sense, then will benefit the Norway as well. Hmm. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, there are some questions related to Arctic policy, but I don't oh, know. Arctic, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. China is very enthusiastic about Arctic shipping. Okay, because you know this cuts down the uh, drastically the 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 the, the running cost. At the same time, they realize that Arctic ecosystem is a, a very fragile one. They realize that actually they are they are a group of you know scientists that are doing work in the Arctic Ocean, including some scientists from my institute. Okay, so we realize that, and uh, therefore the first you know we we have to understand what you know what's going on there, and second of course everybody realizes that Arctic shipping will not be realized in the short term, maybe you know 15 years from now or or, or so, so therefore we have plenty of time to cooperate. Both in the science and in how to do the uh, Arctic shipping in a sustainable way, mm. we can lay down. You know, we we can maybe you know co cooperate to lay down certain guidelines for the international community to, to discuss, right? Mm. Uh, young Gunnar, would you like to comment on some of these things? Uh, yeah, I saw one question about fishery uh, in in the Arctic and um, and, and China's role. Um, there is now under the auspices of the Arctic Council, it goes back uh, a few years. It's a ban on commercial fishery in the Central Arctic Ocean, uh, and uh, the Arctic uh, states, but also uh, China and and a few others like EU. Uh, Japan, uh, South Korea uh, have all signed on on that agreement. And then uh, what's left then is, of course, the coastal territories for the coastal states, uh, and there is some fishery there, but there is really no uh, expected uh, activity connected to fishery. Uh, we have not gone into any detail when it comes to the Arctic uh, on, on issues like uh, oil and gas or minerals or science even. It's been touched upon in the Green Maritime Operation Group, as uh, Professor Sue mentioned. Uh, but um, 
uh, if I should capture the, the main conclusion is that uh, we, we want to uh, underscore the importance of uh, sustainable development uh, connected to the maritime operations and shipping. And if you go white, so going into the ice, you go green. That's kind of a slogan of, uh, it's not written in the report, but that's the fundamental thinking. Um, we are now at the stage of starting a new phase in, in ocean uh, issues in the China Council. Uh, and first for the coming year and thereafter for the coming five years, most likely. Uh, and there is no fixed plan yet if the Arctic will become an important part of our work in, in China Council. And so this is, remains to be seen. But one thing that I also saw in the chat uh, was the tourism. Uh, and of course, tourism, Arctic, Norway, China is, is uh, an, an interesting and, and um, um, possible development. Uh, and um, here, of course, uh, what happens after the COVID-19 is, is uh, it's a very important uh, part of that picture, uh, but as Ilan said earlier today, we have not addressed tourism at all so far in our work and stepping into the next phase now, it's highly likely, I think, that tourism, because it makes up such a big part of China's ocean activities and revenue, uh, should be part of that conversation. So maybe there is a potential without having any decisions behind it that tourism and also the relation between tourism and the region of Arctic could be one um, avenue to take. Okay, uh, we are getting closer to the end of this session. So, but we, and and we will we will we'll end around uh, one fifteen uh, Norwegian time. So in ten minutes time, and before that, we will also have a brief final comment from the uh, ambassador, the Chinese ambassador to Norway. But. Before we, we invite him in, I would like to ask Harald Solberg, uh, you said uh, uh, in your remarks that you, you supported this and you the idea of a, a more uh, green shipping, sustainable management, etc. So could you kind of expand on this? Where do you see kind of global shipping industry going? And of course, China is a very important player in global shipping, partly as a market, but also as a biggest actor. Uh, and how do you see uh, China's role in global governance of shipping and, and, uh, and this recommendation and policy document? Do you see that adding to kind of the whole idea of China being a responsible stakeholder in global governance or or, or so I'm just trying to invite you in to reflect a bit on the relationship between this report and the geopolitics around oceans and shipping that we that we observe these days. That is very much at the core of, of some of the members in your association. Thank you. For, yes, uh, thank you for the question. And I think China plays a very important role in uh, in the framework of, uh, for shipping industry uh, within the UN body IMO. Uh, and I think we, we uh, have to cooperate more closely uh, between Norway and China as well when it comes to the framework for the shipping industry going forward. And especially how do we incentivize, uh, how do we incentivize the development of new technology and alternative fuels? And when we uh, look into the future, uh, a lot of investments uh, have to be done on board the ships, but uh, the biggest investments uh, has to be done in ports uh, and in the infrastructure uh, on uh, onshore. Uh, and I think that uh, both Norway and China uh, should uh, uh, should uh, pay more attention to, to the future uh, fuels, the future energy carriers, uh, whether it should be uh, hydrogen, uh, whether it should be biofuel, uh, LNG, uh, carbon and capture. Uh, uh, so I think there is a lot of uh, important paths that we could uh, follow together uh, to to uh, uh, establish the right incentives for investing in in the uh, in the in the infrastructure we need. And if if I may, uh, if I may also comment on on the Arctic, uh, I I really agree that 
when it, when it comes to Arctic shipping, we talk about fragile environment, and in in this aspect, uh, an integrated uh, approach uh, based on uh, on uh, the recommendations uh, in the report uh, on integrated ocean management would be even more important uh, if we enter into, into the Arctic. Uh, we have to take into account the really challenging operations environment in, in the Arctic with ice, darkness, remote areas. So we, we really have to uh, make up our mind and take into account uh, uh, which kind of measures we should uh, establish to make this activity sustainable in, in a fragile, fragile environment. Mm. Uh, uh, just let me, before we give the floor to the ambassador, let me take a quick round also to uh, Hanna Greta. Uh, do you have a final remark or comment that's, uh, to, to make and maybe also reflect very briefly on what the Norwegian foreign minister talked about um, of plastic and pollution? Uh, is that something that uh, you see also uh, something that potential for cooperation in that area? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I think it's uh, in the further process uh, with detailing the, the, the areas of cooperation, we could look into the various themes and plastic pollution would be one of them, obviously, and other themes as well. And we have to look further on, well, how, um, especially look into how to, uh, how to collect uh, the information and data and, and which themes and areas we should, uh, should uh, look into firstly. So I think uh, we have a lot to choose from and pick from, from the report and also from the experiences we have with the management plans. Mm. Okay, uh, Yilan Su, it's been a pleasure to have you with us uh, uh, here today. Uh, and and uh, I don't know if you would like to make a, a short remark as well towards the end before I give the floor to the ambassador. Are you with us, Ilan? Yes, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm trying to click the uh, the the microphone, you know, <laughs> uh, to get it on. Yes, you know, uh, I think this is a very useful, you know, dialogue. You know, the platform that you provided. Uh, I'm privileged to take part in this. I hope you will have more, not involved in me, but involve some other people, you know, to to uh, to exchange the views between the Norway and and the uh, and China on ocean issues and other issues as well. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the participants for for joining it. But now uh, we the seminar started with a. Uh, two minutes presentation by the which Minister of Foreign Affairs. So according to protocol, uh, it's it's just uh, fair then that also the the the, uh, the Chinese ambassador to, to Norway, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Xiang, uh, Xianliang Yi uh, will uh, give uh, we give him the floor to make uh, short remarks towards the end. Uh, ambassador, great to have you with us uh, and please the floor is yours. Uh, you have to unmute yourself, sir. Okay. Okay, excellent. Hello. Hello, Honorable Professor Su. Nice to meet you again. Uh, Mr. Director uh, Spurdrop, uh, Mr. Wen, uh, Mr. Sorberg, uh, Mrs. Nelson. Well, I think uh, it's my great pleasure to be one part of this uh, webinar. This morning, actually, uh, one hour ago, I had uh, a meeting in person with the Minister of uh, Trade, as well as the Minister of uh, Fisheries, to talk about the uh, cooperation between two sides, particularly the cooperation in maritime affairs between China and Norway. So we have a lot of consensus in this regard this morning. And uh, as you know, this is a special difficult moment by the pandemic. But the ocean cooperation between China and Norway has overcome difficulties and still made steady progress thanks to the great efforts of 
from the two governments, our experts, scholars, and business people. With all of you present here today, it's most prominent representatives. Congratulations to Professor Su, Mr. Wind, and your teams. Mama Gil, both of you gave us a detailed introduction of your report, which focused on the challenges and opportunities of an integrated approach for the ocean management and the development of a sustainable ocean economy in China. Your candidate analysis and valuable suggestions have been put forward. We've also conducted sustainable discussions on the Establish an ocean dialogue and the group partnership between China and Norway. So, I would like to congratulate you again for your successful seminar. As you know, China is a, a major maritime country, just like Norway. Perhaps China and Norway will have quite similar coastlands, it's about 20,000 kilometers. Of course, more than half of the Chinese population lives in coast area. And the coastal province and cities account for as much as 60% of Chinese GDP. President Xi has repeatedly emphasized the need to care for understand and manage the ocean. Ocean governance and ocean economy not only in not only are important ways for China to accelerate industry transform, transformation and the development a low carbon and a circular economy. But also will be a impetus for the global ecological environment. At the fifth plenary session of the 19th Central Committee of CPC, which held last week, which emphasized that during the 14th five-year plan period, China must stick the path of pursuing the native coordinate, green, and open development. So I believe that the ocean issue and your recommendations will contribute your valuable inputs to the drafting of the 14th five-year plan of China. And as you might know, China and Norway had a long time Operation in maritime affairs. More than 150 years ago, DMV had set up a branch in China, in Xiamen, Fujian, Fujian province. It still operate. As you know, China and Norway, we set up the diplomatic relations 1905. So it means 100. 15 years ago, but the, you, you know, the new China has a diplomatic relations with, with Norway for 66 years. But the maritime cooperation is so long time. So every day I talk with some Norwegian people, they always learn about how to promote cooperation. Most of the times we talk about maritime cooperation. So this is Kawet, maritime engineer, fisheries, seafoods, environmental, climate change, and green power. And so of course, oil and gas. Perhaps you know this year is a big challenge for the international trade. However, 
China and the way our threat gone up so fast. The first three quarter, our bilateral threat increased 48.7 percent, and Norwegian export to China increased 141 percent. Most of the export and import are belong to the maritime industry or maritime economy. So that means maritime cooperation for China and Norway is a fundamental element for our relations. Last uh, two months ago, Mr. Wang Yi, the State, State Councillor and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, paid a special visit to Norway. We reached several fields consensus. One of the important is blue partnership. So this morning I talked with the two ministers how to promote such a partnership and the guidelines and the relevant documents how to deal with the cooperation in the future. So I do believe this is quite important measure for two sides. And your report might be also an important input for our schedule, for our mechanism in the future. Because you know this cooperation, this partnership not only belong to the scholars, the industries, but also think tanks is a whole picture one. And I would like to echo the, the comments made by Foreign Minister Sreed just a moment ago in opening remarks. She said maritime cooperation will be the long-term cooperation and important parts of two sides. And it will promote the cooperation in other fields. So let's do our best. I do believe your contribution, particularly this report, will guide the relations in the cooperation in maritime fields. Thanks. And uh, yeah. I'm waiting for the cooperation and also the support from all for you officials, uh, business people, my friends of uh, particular Mr. Strawberg, Strawberg, and also Mr. Su and Ms. Wind in the future. Because you know the embassy and the market, I'm the, in the middle. We are the bridge for China and Norway. Of course, we will be the linkage with the middle points for the cooperation for the maritime fields. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, Chair. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I would just like to uh, to end uh, this session now. But let me first thank uh, uh, Professor Su, uh, Jan Gunnar Winter, uh, Harald Solberg, and Hanne Grete Nielsen for their contribution, and of course, uh, thanks to the Ambassador for uh, her re uh, for his remarks, and also, of course, thanks to the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, who kindly uh, uh, accepted to participate in the opening of this seminar. Let me also thank all the people who have attended this event and who have submitted questions and 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 expressed their interest. Uh, thank you so much for joining. And I'm sorry that we didn't have the time to cover all your topics, but we have tried to, to touch upon some of them. <laughs> I, I don't want to have a concluding remark here, but just very briefly say that I think that we can agree that the, the oceans are in a sorry state. There are we have real difficulties in keeping the oceans. At the same time, the ocean is really important for us as humans. To, uh, uh, so addressing the issue of oceans, ocean governance, sustainable oceans is of critical importance. Uh, secondly, is that I think that you have in your report have somehow highlighted the need for a call to action um, of bringing the issue of oceans 
higher up on the agenda. And I also think that this seminar demonstrated that there are quite a bit of shared principles for sound ocean governance, both in Norway and in China. At the same time, we, will, we have to accept that there are all kinds of, although there are lots of opportunities for cooperation, I think we should embrace those opportunities. At the same time, we have to be frank and honest also about some of the difficulties that are involved in implementing some of the recommendations and principles that we agree on. And that's partly related to domestic politics, but also to, to the nature of international cooperation and also international diplomacy. And, and I wish all the parties all the best in those efforts. And I think that that's something that we should work on, uh, all of us, uh, as we go along. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. We, we, so this session then comes to an end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. <laughs> All right.